Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray Holy for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Carissimi, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass. As we said on this, the feast of Saint Blaise, Bishop of Sebast and Martyr, and we commemorate today the fourth Sunday post Epiphany. It's not often that St. Blaise's Day falls on a Sunday, and uh, it's not often that uh, we're able to uh, celebrate St. Blaise with, with any great solemnity uh, in the uh, modern calendar that other people use. Uh, he is reduced to only a memoria, uh, just a commemoration. And even in traditional circles, uh, his feast day after uh, Pius X was downgraded and downgraded again, uh, so that it is only us, uh, real diehards of tradition, uh, that keep his feast with any uh, kind of uh, solemnity. St Blaise's name, of course, you may recall from what will occur at the end of Mass, uh, the blessing of candles and throats. Uh, but we'll come to why uh, that is so in a few moments. Uh, what We don't know an awful lot about St Blaise, uh, but what we do know, uh, according to tradition, uh, at least from the 8th century, is that he uh, was born uh, at the end of the 3rd century uh, to rich Christian uh, parents in Armenia or Lower Armenia. Uh, now that probably means nothing to anyone very much today uh, because at the turn of the last century uh, Armenia and the Armenians were more or less wiped out uh, by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but if I say Central Anatolia or if I were to say Cappadocia which is a more ancient name, it is uh, uh, Central North Turkey. We might say a few hundred miles north of Antioch. Antioch is situated right down in the very south of uh, Turkey, where Turkey meets uh, Syria. Uh, there uh, is Antioch to the extreme, so if Antioch's down here, uh, in the extreme southwest, uh, are Ephesus and Laodicea and Hierapolis uh, and uh, those other uh, famous churches of the early church and then above here sort of here is Sebast and there is Cappadocia. He was born to as I say uh, Christian parents and he was fortunate uh, in, uh, to grow up in a, in a relative time of peace and able to study philosophy though it actually was medicine that he eventually professed as uh, a physician. Then he discovered, or um, not discovered, sorry, then he discerned a vocation to a higher calling, we might say, to the sacred ministry, and indeed was uh, acclaimed uh, as a bishop of Sebast. Then came uh, a great period of persecution, the great persecution under Diocletian, the last of the great persecutions before the peace of Constantine. And so uh, this is around, and this, this actually was towards the very end uh, of uh, the persecution, that is to say that uh, the, um, uh, as it were, the official persecution had already by this time ended. Uh, with, the, with the arrival of Constantine around uh, 312 uh, to 314. Uh, whereas in the far-flung places of the empire, we might say, it was still raging. And certainly in 316, in uh, Sebastian, Cappadocia, uh, Christianity was still being uh, uh, outlawed and Christians being arrested. So he took himself out of Sebast uh, when, the when the persecutions began uh, to dwell in a cave. Now, he, he, didn't, uh, he wasn't deserting his post. Uh, he simply uh, left uh, the city, uh, but was still visited uh, by the faithful uh, in his cave. And there too, uh, he was uh, surrounded by uh, wild beasts uh, whom, who became tame in his presence. There are all sorts of uh, miraculous stories 
about uh, the wild beasts and, uh, uh, and our saint. But eventually his cover was blown. Uh, he was discovered by a hunting party because uh, they had been uh, tracking a heart. Uh, the heart had found and sought uh, uh, safety with some blaze. And of course the hunters then discovered the bishop. They reported him then to the authorities and so he was frog-marched back to Sebastian face trial. Uh, there uh, he was uh, sentenced uh, variously to starvation and uh, then to scourging and eventually to beheading. But on the route to uh, his trial, uh, various of the faithful uh, came out to greet him, uh, to seek his blessing uh, on his journey and to uh, uh, some of them to acquire uh, some healing. And so it was that a woman appeared with a little boy who ha was literally choking from a fishbone. St. Blaise made the sign of the cross, prayed a prayer, and the boy was released from the fishbone uh, in his throat and able to breathe. And it is for that reason that today, at the end of Mass, we traditionally bless throats. St. Blaise is also one of the 14 Holy Helpers. The 14 Holy Helpers include saints such as St. Barbara, St. Uh, Christopher, uh, St. Joan of Arc, uh, various uh, saints noted uh, for their effective intercession uh, regarding healing uh, or other forms of assistance, but mostly healing. Uh, they were particularly invoked uh, during the Great Black Death, or the Great Plague, uh, that at one time uh, variously uh, um, uh, affected uh, Europe uh, during the Middle Ages. And uh, St Blaise's prayers, or the intercession of St Blaise, uh, were considered most effective uh, against some of the symptoms of the plague. The Black Death... One of the symptoms was that people's tongues turned black, black spots and other things appeared uh, and uh, it really was a, a most foul and, and terrible uh, way of, of dying. But uh, the intercession of the 14 Holy Helpers, as we say, seemed to assist and to relieve at least some of the symptoms of those who contracted it. Uh, the death, the Black Death or the, or the plague, um, uh, wiped out, decimated indeed, um, most of Europe um, at its height. And there are still um, uh, memorials, we might say, to this day uh, of its effect. For example, uh, not far from here, um, uh, near Lansing College, um, at some, there's a little place called St Botos, um, and uh, the church there, which is along uh, the River Ada, at uh, one time, of course, there would have been uh, a, a hamlet, and indeed at one time it was a thriving uh, village until the Black Death, and all that remains now is the parish church. So we pray today uh, for, uh, we give thanks today for the uh, life and witness of St Blaise. Uh, we give uh, thanks uh, for uh, his legend, for we give thanks for the testimony of his life and uh, for his intercession all these centuries since. We also pray for uh, the remnants of those Armenian Christians uh, who, are, who, who, are, who were genocidally decimated at the turn of the last century and we remember all those uh, Christians, our brothers and sisters in the faith, enduring persecution in other places and parts of the world. The Sundays after Epiphany continue, of course, the theme of manifestation and of revelation. And in today's Gospel, for the fourth Sunday, uh, we hear about our Lord calming the storm, demonstrating, manifesting, revealing, he again, his divinity, that he has power over the elements, has power over the weather, has power over the sea and the waves. And we too, my brothers and sisters, in our own turn, as we reflected yesterday on the Feast of the Purification of Candlemas, we too, of course, 
are uh, like St. Blaise and all Christians throughout the centuries to manifest Christ to our world. And indeed, I just want to repeat uh, some of the epistle given for today's Mass for St. Blaise. Brethren, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful Father, the God who gives all encouragement. He it is who comforts us in all our trials, and it is this encouragement we ourselves receive from God which enables us to comfort others whenever they have trials of their own. The sufferings of Christ, it is true, overflow into our lives, but there is overflowing comfort too, which Christ brings to us. Have we trials to endure? It all makes for your encouragement, for your salvation. Are we comforted? It is so that you may be comforted. Are we encouraged? It is for your encouragement, for your salvation. And the effect of this appears in your willingness to undergo the sufferings we too undergo, making our hopes of you all the more confident. Partners of our sufferings, you will be partners of our encouragement too, in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is, I think, a beautiful epistle and sums up particularly one of the ways in which we, my brothers and sisters, as Christians in our world, can manifest and reveal that light of hope which is Christ in our lives and in the lives of others. St Paul here, of course, is referring to the trials and tribulations that he was enduring for the sake of the gospel and that others too were enduring. And the same is true for us today. While we seem to be living in relative peace here in the West, we know that Christians in other parts of the world, particularly in Asia, particularly in Africa, particularly in the Middle East, are suffering for our faith in Christ. But we know too, of course, that suffering goes on around us here in our local communities. We know that suffering is manifested in despair, in desolation. It is manifested in those who are homeless, those who are poor, those who are imprisoned by vice, by addiction, by alcoholism, by narcotics. And two, true, others who are imprisoned by a vice like pornography, like uh, gaming, like uh, social media. Those who are imprisoned by virtual reality. And all of this, really, we might sum up as escapism. People, generally speaking, are seeking to, are finding life so hard and so difficult that they fall into the traps of these roots of escape and become then isolated by them, become increasingly cut off. Somebody who is in the, uh, who is deeply uh, affected by addiction often uh, becomes isolated from family and friends, isolated from society. And as I say, we can see the same symptoms, not just amongst those who are alcoholics or suffering with, uh, from narcoticism, but also with those uh, in virtual reality, trapped, enclosed in virtual realities. We're all guilty of it. We all sit in groups, supposedly having coffee and uh, looking at the flashing screens on our phones. If you go out into the street, you will see various people walking along looking at their phones. And all of it really is a form of escapism. Now, as with anything, there could be good uh, with technology and with invention. See, on the other hand, there is the opportunity, the ability with smartphones, etc., to be able to uh, research and learn about all sorts of useful things on the internet. Indeed, we can read the scriptures, we can read the writings of the early church fathers, 
We can read the lives of the saints. We can read the doctrines of the church. We can read today's mass. There are all sorts of useful things we can use uh, these technologies for. And always, of course, it's about uh, finding and striking a balance with the utilization of these things. Now, at the end of today's mass, we're going to use a sacramental. A sacramental, not a sacrament, but a sacramental. Whereas a sacrament uh, signifies and proclaims the grace that it is uh, guaranteed to bestow. So, for example, baptism uh, bestows the grace, of course, of salvation. The sacrament of penance uh, bestows uh, forgiveness in absolution. The sacrament of uh, holy order, of course, uh, bestows ordination, the, sac the, uh, the sacred ministry. These are guaranteed means by which we know God's grace is assured and becomes operative. Sacramentals, on the other hand, are instituted by the Church after the model of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, of course, in instituting, instituting the sacraments, uh, uses um, everyday things uh, and uh, gives them a particular and special pur <coughs> purpose, which then guarantees grace. With sacramentals, the Church similarly takes everyday things and blesses them in the hope that, uh, some, that we will be able to cooperate with God's grace. Sacraments contain grace. Sacramentals are a means to grace or a means of uh, uh, employing grace. They are a way for us to cooperate with God's grace. Now, of course, examples of sacramentals occur in Scripture, uh, in the, particularly in the miracles of our Lord, for example, uh, like when he uh, moulds clay uh, to heal someone, when he sticks his fingers in somebody's ear to heal someone, uh, when he heals someone by touch, when he heals someone by breathing on them, when he heals someone by word, when he heals someone by will, uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, we have examples of sacramentals of our Lord taking ordinary objects and using them for extraordinary means. In like fashion then, so we use uh, sacramentals in the life of the church. Sacramentals then are things like holy water, uh, blessed crosses and crucifixes and rosaries, uh, ashes on Ash Wednesday, palms on Palm Sunday, and Yesterday, of course, candles at Candlemas. These things have been blessed and set apart, uh, again, usually for a particular purpose, uh, usually to, as a way of uh, reminding us of God's power and effect and presence in our lives. The light of the candles yesterday reminding us of the light of Christ that dispels darkness and brings hope to those who despair. We remembered yesterday that we are called to be lights to the world uh, and to go into the world and share the light of Christ. But in order to do that, sometimes we might ourselves need to remember uh, God's presence in our lives and his power and effect. So that at the end of today's Mass, we will bless uh, two candles which will then be uh, uh, made into a cross shape uh, and used to bless throats. Now, uh, we're not saying that uh, these candles themselves have, by our blessing, become uh, uh, inherently holy uh, <coughs> of themselves. And we're not saying that these candles of themselves can heal throats. That would be superstition. That would be uh, 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 blasphemy, that would be nonsense. Rather what we're saying is that uh, through the intercession on this occasion of St Blaise, uh, through our prayer, we are praying that by being touched by these candles we may be healed from and protected from uh, diseases and ailments of the throat. And likewise, in like fashion, my brothers and sisters, uh, when we employ other sacramentals, 
like for example rosaries or blessed crucifixes and crosses or indeed holy water, uh, we need to be uh, sure and have clear in our minds uh, the correct and proper use of them. You know, Holy Mother Church is not suggesting necessarily that these objects themselves contain power, but is saying that the use of them may affect God's power, having been blessed and having had God's power invoked upon them. And this is why uh, we treat sacramentals uh, with respect. This is why, um, uh, for example, often uh, I am given uh, rosaries and crucifixes and um, Bibles and things uh, when people have died. Uh, it's not so often, sad to say, but um, uh, used to be the case that uh, undertakers or those who would do house clearances, uh, these sort of religious objects, uh, if there was no family for them to be handed on to or if the family didn't want them, uh, then they would be taken to churches, they would be given uh, to priests, uh, rather than uh, be destroyed or be uh, casually thrown away. Because people recognise that these things are no longer just ordinary, they are holy, um, they have been, been blessed, they have been set apart. But in like fashion too, my brothers and sisters, are we sacramentals? Indeed, we have been blessed and set apart. We in, uh, have been, by virtue of our baptism, set apart. Uh, by, uh, we have become citizens of heaven. We are exiles from heaven here on earth. Uh, but similarly too, we are sacramentals because uh, in the pursuance of holiness uh, and in various ways through the liturgical life of the church we are blessed innumerable times we uh, receive blessings at the end of services at the end of mass uh, we receive uh, blessings like today of the throats and other things uh, blessing of, of Christ himself in the presence of the blessed sacrament of benediction and of course when we receive the Holy Eucharist we become then sacramentals, as it were, uh, of God's presence in us. And indeed, my brothers and sisters, we should think of ourselves as sacramentals. Perhaps thinking of ourselves as sacramentals as Christians may prevent us from, all, from falling into that despair, falling into that desperation, falling into that escapism and that virtual reality that others do. Perhaps if we remembered that we are blessed, that we have been set apart for God's service, that we are like a blessed crucifix or holy water or blessed candles or ashes or palms, we are no longer just ordinary human beings, but we have been blessed for God's purpose. We have been set apart. We have been made holy and are being made holy. Every time we are blessed, every time we receive the Eucharist, every time we are absolved, we are being made holy. And that, my brothers and sisters, the remembrance of that should help us to maintain that holiness. And sacramentals are given as a way of reminding us of holiness and thus reminding us, hopefully, of our own holiness and the pursuit of holiness. Let us then, my brothers and sisters, let us then remember God's power in Christ. Power that such as manifested in him to calm storms, to uh, control the weather, to command the weather even, as well as to effect healing and miracles. But let us remember that we too have a similar ability by asking and praying for God's power 
and effect in our lives and in the lives of others. And that we too are called to be sacramentals, tools and instruments of God's will and purpose in the world. Blessed to be blessed. Made holy to become holy. And indeed by sanctifying our lives, seeking to sanctify the world around us. And in so doing, manifesting the light of Christ to dispel darkness and gloom and despair and instead to radiate our Christian hope, the knowledge of our love, the knowledge of God's love for us. He who is Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.